doesn't need to be from the next coconut tree. I like 40 foot spacing on coconuts. For plantations, they say 20 feet you can do. Um, but 40 foot spacing makes it so the fronds are not touching each other. If the fronds are touching, they're banging against each other. It's constantly, slightly injuring the tree. Also, if you have a wide spacing like that, the trees go straight up. If you have trees that are really close together, they lean right out. So if you're going to try to climb those trees with the climber, it makes it extremely difficult or impossible. Um, also, coconut trees um, create really dappled shade. When they get that tall, if they're just dropping their fruit, you can pick it up from the ground. You don't have to do any work. You just walk up to the tree and pick up fruit off the ground. That's efficiency. Right? And if the tree is way up there, it's creating very light shade, so you can grow a lot of other things around underneath that tree. Okay, so we've got our coconut overstory, and then we've got our understory of ulu, avocado, you know, all these other plants. Yeah. In nature, it seems like coconut trees grow in clumps. They do because they drop their coconuts around them, and then that's what sprouts. Yeah, but I'm sure that they're healthy. Um, they may be, but they may not be easy to climb. And they may create a lot of dense shade in a big clump like that that's not as usable to plant other plants in around. Hmm. How safe is it having your ulu trees under coconut trees? Um, <laughs> it's nice to have it. It's nice to have it spaced out far enough. Um, and also around coconut trees, I like to plant some kind of a, a bed around the bases so you're not walking directly under it. Like, you know, like a an eight foot radius all the way around the bed so you're not constantly you know walking right underneath a coconut tree that could drop coconuts on it. Things that can take a coconut falling on them. Things are already sure. Um, all the, there's lots of ground covers here. Um, so we've got um let's see. So we're uh, setting yourself up for being hit on the head if you're planning this stuff you got me done on I don't spend a lot of time it's not something I spend a lot of time there. And you worry about I mean, put your bike helmet on the floor. Put a bike helmet. Yeah, put a helmet on, there you go. Um I mean I spend maybe like you know a minute under the bed in a year. No. Okay. So my brother has a 70-foot and he has a shield. Usually you can trash it because you can't walk under the tree without walking Okay, so um, any other <laughs> quick questions on coconuts? <laughs> yeah. If people don't want to use a spike, I have a access to a coconut husker. It's really easy to do for machete, so it's pretty much not damaging your body. Okay. So it allows people who are not physically able to hack it apart things to Yeah, he says he's Locally got some kind of a special tool. You can talk wow. to him about that. Um, okay, so moving on, uh, Ulu. Right, this is a great carb crop. Okay, lives a long time. Um, they can get really tall. It's good to prune them to keep them harvestable. Okay, that, this goes with pretty much, pretty much all the trees on this list. If you see something that says 50, 60 feet, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to let it get that tall. Okay. Um, there's also a link here to um, Ulu propagation or breadfruit propagation or <coughs> production guide, I think it's called, um, and it tells you how to prune the trees, how to use the fruit, all that information. So I highly recommend checking it out. It's it's a free download. Um, gives you all information on Hulu. But you can not so studio for a thousand feet. Yeah. Sorry, Sorry, that link is on your... That link is on your... That link's on here in the back. Okay. Yep. Oh, it's um, So, Hulu, excellent. Um, you, can, you can use the fruit. You know, cooked as a starch. Or let it ripen on the tree for another way to use it. You can let it ripen and cook it there. Um, raw, it's a purgative. So don't eat it with raw. Unless you, uh, you want to throw up. Oh, the, the Samoan kind you can eat raw? Yeah, after it's soft. After it's really soft. Because I've had friends who were like, oh yeah, you can eat this, and then ate it, and then... 
So, so it's small and kind only, huh? No, yeah, they, it, it's it's so if it's sweet. I, I mine all the time. You use all the time? Well, it's I mean, soft. I'll do the pancakes. But the pancakes, you're cooking it. But, but the inside is still raw. <laughs> no. Nah. But it's sweet. It's sweet. It's sweet. Yeah. It's sweet. Anyways, let's move on. There's lots of ways to use them. Check out the production guide. It's excellent. I, I mean, there's just so much information on them. Can you uh, tell us what FS means and PHS? Um, it's, at, it's in the beginning of the thing. It's on the, on the page before. What's his name? Okay, God, thank you. Um, so avocado, um, really great fat crop. Have different seasons. You need different trees for different seasons to get them year round. Right? Also, another one you want to prune if you want to be able to harvest the fruit. If you let them drop, you can do that as well. But you got to have some soft ground, and you also got to beat the pigs to them. You got pigs and rats. Okay, so keeping your trees pruned down, um, you know, 20, 25 feet, so you still reach them with a picker. Gra grafted trees. I rec highly recommend getting grafted trees because you know what season it's going to be. You know the quality of the fruit. Um, you can do seedling trees as well, but they're highly variable. Just because this, you plant the seed from this avocado, there's an excellent avocado, doesn't mean that's what that, what that seed is going to produce. And you've waited five to ten years. And you've waited five out. to ten years to find out. <laughs> right? So why put all that effort into a tree that, I mean, if you've got, if you've got like a zone five, you've got a lot of area, throw those pits out. Sure, see what happens. If you have some bad ones, cut them down. But if you've got a limited area or in closer, I highly recommend grafted trees. But also make sure you're covering your bases of getting that year-round production. Question? Yeah. Uh, is there a difference between shiny and matte on the avocado when you're harvesting? I've heard different things about that. Um, I'm not really sure. Anybody else? When they, when they get mature, they're supposed to get more matte. And then the stem is supposed to start to turn brown. Yeah. And and if you if you pick it before that, it, it, oftentimes it won't it won't ripen. Yeah. So the stem turning brown that's the main indicator that I've heard of before. For if the stem is brown, then then it's then you can pick it and it will still ripen up. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's a stem that's still completely green, probably won't. In low Thank elevations, you. kahulu avocados are beyond amazing. Lower elevations, kahulu, awesome. Fairly short season though, right? It's worth it. It's worth it though. Yeah. Yeah. Super high fat content. There's different fat contents for avocados as well. So this is another uh, reason to get grafted trees because you'll know what you're getting because there's a huge range as far as the fat content in avocados. So when do you need to graft? Like should I wait five years and then go, oh, these avocados aren't good, so I'm cut the tree and graft them? Um, you can. That's called top working. You can, you can cut the top of that tree off and then graft to it. There's a couple different ways people do it. I don't want to get too far into that. Um, but look it, look it up. You, it can definitely be done. I've got a lot of trees on my place that, I, that are just seedling trees. were there when I got there that I, want to, that I want to cut back and then graft onto different varieties. And you can put multiple varieties on the same tree if you're limited on space. Yes, you can put multiple varieties on the same tree if you have limited space. Any suggestions on extracting the oil, avocado oil? Extracting avocado oil, I don't. Um, I mean, I would just eat the avocado and eat coconuts. That's a great extractor. Planet Hawaii has the, the dates listed. Uh, I buy they don't have any on August, September. They don't have any on August, September? Well, August, September? Anybody? Avocado, August, September, variety? All of my girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wall. Um, okay, so moving on with avocado. Um, papaya. <coughs> Extremely versatile. You can use it green, you can use it ripe. Seeds are antiparasitic. Um, let's see, what else? Um, you can cook the green fruit as a vegetable. Yep. Best way to harvest the seeds. Best way to harvest the seeds to uh, right them. out of here. Not to replant them. To replant them. Cut it open and replant them. Uh, you can plant them fresh. You can dry them. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I've done a bunch of experimenting with 
I get the best uh, production by taking the seeds out of the papaya and putting them in flats and, and planting them when the seeds are wet and green. And if I dry the fresh. seeds, if it, the percentage is slower, they're, they're, they're weaker. Gotcha. So he's saying he has a lot of, he has better results with fresh seeds. Other people share that? Yeah? If you want to dry them, you want to take the that sticky layer off because okay. when it dries, it dries like shrink wrap, and that's oh. why you don't get good germination. Okay. So you want to ferment them a little bit or pulse them in your Cuisinart with the bread blade, not the sharp blade, okay. and get that and then float them. Okay, so she's that saying that it's, that it's the coating that's, that's shrink wrapping onto them that makes them do that. So fresh is a good way to to do that or make sure that coat is off. When you cook them green, they're like potato? Uh, when they cook them in green, they're kind of like um, chayote. Mm. Oh, great. Kind of like a squash, like a, oh, right. like a young, very young squash. You can bake them right. Oh yeah, baking it right, she says, you can do as well. Um, so the next one is cassava. Um, cassava is a root crop. It's another a staple crop in many parts of the world. You cut it from stem cuttings. Just take this, stick it in the ground. That's it. Gross. Gets a big root. It's um. You, you can also eat the leaves, but you have to cook them. It's toxic. It's to you got to cook it like at least 45 minutes. The root. Um, it needs enough soil to put its roots out in you because it'll get huge roots. Um, it's a carbohydrate crop. <coughs> not nutrient wise, it's not super great. But it's drought tolerant. So if there's a drought and your ulu drops all its root, which they will do during, during droughts, you've got this as a backup. Mm -hmm. And it's quite delicious, I find. The cooking process is this kind of poisonous. You know, You've got to cook it. You've got to cook it 45 minutes at and least. change the water? No, you don't need to change the water. Oh, just cook it 45 Just cook it 45 minutes. I usually just boil it, and I cut it into, cut it into pieces, and then boil it. What's poisonous about it? Um, it's got hydrogen cyanide in it. Oh, okay. But it keeps most things from eating it, except for pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Right. The roots and the leaves, but the main car the carbs are in the in the root, and then the leaf is just a secondary crop. Um, highly recommend growing cassava, um, but it does need to be if you got pigs around, it does need to be protected from pigs. There's also there's some way that um, if it's not grown in the right way, or there's, there's a way that it, it's poisonous. That a neighbor of mine um, had a pig growing, and it was all like pushed up and everything. And it, Somebody ended up coming, like, she met somebody from her church who said that, oh no, they were from Thailand or Philippines or something, and they were like, oh wow, don't eat it like that. Huh. Uh, like, it was all, like, massive bush. And oh, interesting. Was, I've never heard about that, but maybe she's saying there's that actually, it... There's a book in the library. That, okay. Really nice. I think some people are sensitive to it, and they just can't eat it, too. And maybe... Um, so cassava, so pumpkin, excellent ground cover, local variety here. This will turn completely this tan color. It's completely ripe. Um, Do you have a name for that for other local varieties? I just call it local variety. I, I mean, some people call it kabucha, um, but it doesn't really look like the kabuchas you find in the store very much. Um, Definitely. But you can also use, eat the, the young tips, high in calcium. And the seeds. Uh, you can eat the, the seeds, too. you can also eat the seeds, yeah, high in, in protein and oil, the seeds. You can eat the leaves too. Yeah, you can eat the young leaves as well. Yeah. Yep. The flowers too are really good. The flower is good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so pumpkin, great ground cover, great to do around other trees and orchard areas when they're getting established. You know, just let it spread. What about the rotting when they're in a wet climate? It always, we tried it before and they always rot it. Um, anybody, solutions about rotting pumpkins? I say this variety is really good for that. 
Yeah, this variety is good for that. Oh, got a real hard Just shell. put a board it's under them or something. If you so put a board under them. Mm -hmm. saying if you were to put a board under it, put a board it's starting to form. Then the yeah, other the bugs don't oh. get bore up. So the bugs don't bore up into it. Yeah. That's a good idea. You can grow them on a trellis too. Yeah, yeah I've got them at my place. They're like growing up the other vines on my mango trees, like pumpkins, like up here. Let the weeds grow around them to keep the fruit flies off. Yeah. I have difficulty growing like pumpkin and squash. So it seems like it's doing well, and then you know flowers, and then nothing comes out of it. And then nothing comes out of it. Right. Um, it takes a long time. Pollination. There's larva, it takes a long time to yeah, produce. And, and some varieties are, are daylight sensitive, so they only produce male flowers in the short daylight. I think that's what's going on with mine. Yeah. Mine were bumper crop, bumper crop, bumper crop, and now just the last like couple months have gotten nothing. Yeah. So they just produce male, and then in so, the longer daylight, they start to produce the Thank female. you. I don't know if you guys heard that. So coming into the, 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 the winter, so is there a variety that, that doesn't do that? The only one we've found so far and we is uh, the Tahitian squash, which is like the big butternut, and that seems to do okay in short daylight. Okay, too. perfect. So variety, again. So this Tahitian squash he has is saying that it's much less daylight sensitive. So, okay, it's so, so it'll produce while you know these other ones aren't. So. Variety is, is super crucial with with all these plants, with a lot of these plants. If you're getting a lot of blossoms and no fruit, you can eat the blossoms too. You can, but I mean a blossom, like, I mean, how, many blo how many blossoms does this thing eat? Stuff them. Oh, man. I sometimes have them. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying you can't eat them, it's just... Do you actually put the seeds, I mean, do you dig in and put the seeds in the ground or do you just throw them around? Yes, yeah, I plant the seeds. You can plant them fresh, you can plant them dry. I haven't seen that matter. Um, so, uh, taro. So you guys probably, everybody knows what taro looks like, right? Yeah. Taro, great crop. Um, again, needs protection from pigs. Um, likes a lot of mulch. Um, See what else I'm gonna say about taro. Um, you you uh, propagate it from a huli, which is the top part of the plant. Oh. Top of the stem, got the root. You just want to make sure you've got some brown root on the bottom of your plant. And there's a little new shoot in here that you don't want to damage when you cut it off up here. And you just plant this like that. Ever yeah. want to eat the leaves raw. Don't ever eat the leaves raw, absolutely not. Is that the soil level you do it you, you do it at yeah, the soil level? Yeah. So when you plant it, you know, you plant it down here, when it grows it'll be like up here. Okay. It like raises up out of the Is there a raises up. that you shouldn't eat? Because that one with the dark stem, I feel like that one's just decorative. With the dark stem, um, I'm not sure. There are some edible and some. Some are more for so yeah, boy. There's lots of different stem colors. Here's a couple of taro leaves. So that dark stem one is fine. And then this one here, yeah. And then this is ape taro, which you can stem of. It can get huge. This is a good, really good famine crop. Um, it takes a really long cook time on the stem. You'll have a corn like the stem will come up out of the ground. Um, but it's a good famine crop because it'll live for many years. It won't. Like taro roots will often rot. But this thing has a stem that'll just keep growing. So it's a great famine food. Mm -hmm. Does it have a root you can eat? Uh, ape, it's on the thing. It's on your handout. Ape taro. Is there a root on the ape do you eat? Um no, it's really the stem. The stem is like a corm on a taro kind of that grows up out of the ground. Um, let's see, another good uh, famine crop um, that's on there is um, I don't know how good it is. There's two others though that I want to mention is um canna. Oh, we're on famine crops. Canna, this is edible canna. It has a root um, that looks kind of like ginger. It's a rhizome. Um, it's not the most palatable thing, but you know, it's, it's a famine crop, right? If you, if you got nothing, nothing else, it makes a good mulch crop, crop. it's beautiful. Um, see another one is tea, tea root, T I. 
um, the root is edible and was eaten in times of famine by the Hawaiians. <coughs> and it's also a great fodder crop. You know, if you've got like rabbits, guinea pigs, goats, oh. all love to eat tea leaves. Mm. Tea leaves, very useful mm. plant. A couple more famine crops. A couple more famine crops, um, yeah. Hilamile is actually pretty good. Sink Hilamile? You can wash it out under hot water and then serve it. The leaves or the? Yeah, the leaves. The leaves. It's actually pretty good. I said it to the family and didn't tell them what it was. Oh. And they liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and did you hear that? Honohono. Right. Honohono Hono. Hono Hono is edible. Um, and she's saying stink miley is edible as well. But you young noni leaves. <laughs> stink miley is edible. You wash it out. I wouldn't, I mean, there's so many different leaf crops that are edible. I, mean, I do eat honohono once in a while, um, just because there's so much of it around. But I mean, there's a lot of leaf crops that are secondary, secondarily edible, like for like sweet, so sweet potato, taro, cassava. Noni. Uh, noni. What else? What's other, other secondary leaves? Yeah. We don't get that. Um, Shia. And I, yeah, I have Yeah, edible hibiscus. Um, so moving on to other plants on the list here, because we're about to do a tour here in just a minute. I want to wrap this up in like five minutes. The last 75 plants. Um, <laughs> but they're all right here. Um, they're, um, you know, they're, let's see. So let's just run down, and I want to say something really quick about most of these. Chayote, the fruit, leaf tips, edible. Um, you can use it like uh, zucchini, really aggressive vine. Mm -hmm, we have. You can plant it up non bearing trees to get them to be bearing something. Um, shia, we've got shia here, there's uh, two different kinds. We've got, um, we've got the uh, this is the spiny chaya, and this is the non-spiny chaya. Um, high protein, really good green, really easy to grow, drought tolerant. You can just take these and stick them in the ground, they'll grow. Okay, we've got um, edible hibiscus, which are wilted up, but you'll see them on the tour. Huge leaves, nutritionally similar to kale. Also extremely easy to grow, a little slimy, you can see that. <laughs> um, but, it's, but it's in the same family as okra, and this the slime will cook right out of it. Um, I really like this. The chaya and the edible hibiscus are probably my two, the two greens that I consume the most. Uh, let's see, then we've got um, another green is, um, is Brazilian spinach or sisu spinach. I listed as sisu on my list. And this is a great ground cover. Um, leaves are edible. They are high in oxalic acid when raw, so I usually cook those. Um, the chaya has to be cooked. It's high, high in hydrogen cyanide. Um, the edible hibiscus you can eat raw or cooked. How long do you have to cook the chaya? Um, just like five minutes. Oh. Yeah, short cook time. What about katuk? Is it on the uh, list? Katuk. Yeah. It took here. Another good one. You can eat it raw or or cooked. But not in large quantities. <coughs> not in very large quantities. What are the the leaves? Leaves? Um, oh, there were there were some great. people who were juicing it as a diet craze, <laughs> and they um, they were getting some like liver damage, I think. Hmm. But they're juicing large amounts of it raw. Um, so adding a little bit in a salad. Probably not going to hurt you. There's lots of plants that have anti-nutritive qualities. Okay? And cooking deactivates many of them. What about the berries and stuff? You can't eat the berries. I don't, I don't particularly like the berries. Mm. Good when they're young. Let's see. Okay, so going down the line. We've got citrus. Lemons and limes for citrus produce like... I've got a, I've got a Tahitian lime tree. It always has fruit on it. There's none of this waiting for citrus season. <laughs> it always has fruit. You know, so if you're going to have a citrus tree, why not have that? Oh, it's sour. Well, um, add some uh, sugar cane to it. Miracle berry. Um, extremely productive. Huh? Tangelo with lower Tangelo. elevations. Tangelos. Tangelos are excellent. Um, just the quality of their fruit makes them worthwhile. Um, so lemons, limes, 
especially Meyer lemons, uh, lily koi, another extremely productive, it's like a weed, that's what we want, we want like food crops that are like weeds that are just plant themselves and just grow like mad. So what if you have to cut it, if it gets too aggressive, you have to cut it back, I'll take that problem. <laughs> Um, let's see, uh, Moringa, I didn't bring a Moringa with me, um, but it's highly nutritious. Mm. It's got a leaf a little bit similar to this. Um, gets into a large tree, extremely nutritious. Um, and then we've got a bread nut, which is similar to uh, Ulu, except it's all seeds. <laughs> that can grow at higher elevation. Um, so if you can't do Ulu, you can still do bread nut. Uh, same family. It uh, may be called Ulu so nut as well. Smaller? Um, no, they still get pretty. They still get pretty big. Yeah. It's kind of like an Ulu with seeds. It's like an Ulu that's that's almost mostly seeds. We've had it before. Uh, you eat the seeds? You eat the seeds. Yeah, you cook the seeds. It's the original. Yeah, and then so and then we have um, then we have jackfruit, which um, makes a lot of a sweet fruit, but also the seeds of jackfruit you can eat. Um, you can cook those down, they've got a little husk on them, you take that off, you can uh, blend them up, make them into like a hummus type thing. Uh, quite good, produces massive amounts of fruit. You'll see one out in the orchard here when we do our walk in a minute. Um, jackfruit can do higher elevation as well. Yeah. And jackfruit also you can cook the fruit when it's, when it's still young. You can make, um, you can make like, uh, it's, People use it as like a meat substitute sometimes because the texture mm. is like um, is kind of like stringy like that. So you're so about the flesh as opposed to the seed. The, the flesh, everything, the seeds, everything. Well, it's still young before it's formed seed coats. You can just chop it all up. There's recipes online for like uh, jack, young jackfruit pulled pork. <laughs> it looks exactly like it, too. It's crazy. You got to make sure you oil your knife. Oil your knife, yes. <laughs> and your pan, too. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. So when you're talking about uh, the jackfruit, how, how big is it when it's completely young for that meat replacement phase? Um, fairly small. Okay. And there's fairly no small. seed development in it? Um, there seeing? is still seed development, but it hasn't formed. Because they form this little, like, uh, like tough layer around the seeds, so you just want to get it before, and you just may need to do a little experimentation. I haven't used it too much. Yeah. How do you know when jackfruit's ripe? Uh, smell, <laughs> color, fruit flies flying around it. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, macadamia nut. Um, another great one. Again, you have, do you have to beat the pigs to them though? If you're letting them fall on the ground. Um, they take the raw from the tree? Yeah, crunch, crunch, crunch. Well, you dry yep. it. They'll eat them right off the ground. It's really loud. You can hear them crunching on it. <laughs> um, so we got uhi, the Chinese yam, which I didn't bring a root of, um, but I did bring a seed of it. Can't find I'll show you later. Um, but it's an aggressive vine. Um, it'll die back when it's formed its roots, and they can form huge roots. It's a really underused crop. Um, the uhi, or Chinese yam, and there's several different varieties. There's one variety that forms a long tuber like this. There's some varieties that form, they look almost exactly like potatoes, and then there's some that form like this kind of like multi-lobed, weird alien looking root. <laughs> Um, but I, I highly recommend um, getting the different varieties. Mountain yam is what one of the small ones goes by. Um, the name, common name. Um, then we have air potato, which is in that same family. It produces aerial tubers. Okay, so it produces these on the vine. Same family. Um, not nearly as aggressive as a vine. Um, can take a little bit of shade. Um, and there is a wild version of this that has that uh, circular fruit that is not edible and it's highly invasive. So this one has earned a bad reputation because of that wild uh, cousin, the non-cultivated type. Okay, so if it's totally, if it's like a ball, 
that is not what you want. That is a weed. This thing, see how it's weird and angular? <laughs> and sometimes they'll be really odd shapes too and have different lobes that look kind of like livers. <laughs> That's the one you want. And just get it from somebody who has, has been growing it for food and then you'll know you have the right one. What do you do with that? Um, you can uh, eat it like potato. Um, no, I don't believe so. I don't so. think so. I, I had bought some from somebody and I knew nothing about it, looked it up, and it said it can be very toxic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to you want to cook it. It doesn't take very long to cook it though. Um, let's see. Uh, Katuk, we talked about Katuk. Um, Katuk, you can do from uh, woody stem cuttings. You want to use the older wood, sections of that, and just plug it into the ground. Um, you got, we talked about sisu spinach, the low ground cover. Again, that can be done from very simple cuttings. Um, and then we've got ginger and turmeric that I included in the top 25. Um, just because of their seasoning qualities or medicinal qualities, mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't imagine not having them around in my diet regularly. So how do you plant ginger? Do you just take pieces of the... Yeah, ginger, you take pieces, like two-inch sections of the root. You want to cut them, and you want to let them heal over. Ideally, you want to let them heal over so, it, so it's not wet when you put them in the ground, just like a day or overnight even. And then, and then turmeric, you can just use, like, you know, the smaller sections of root, or you can use the mother root. Koi, another extremely productive, it's like a weed, that's what we want, we want like food crops that are like weeds that are just plant themselves and just grow like mad. So what if you have to cut it, if it gets too aggressive, you have to cut it back, I'll take that problem. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Moringa, I didn't bring a Moringa with me, um, but it's highly nutritious, it's got a leaf a little bit similar to this. Um, gets into a large tree, extremely nutritious. Um, and then we've got a bread nut, which is similar to uh, ulu, except it's all seeds. That can grow at higher elevation. Um, so if you can't do ulu, you can still do bread nut. Uh, same family. Uh, maybe called ulu nut as well. Smaller? Um, no, they still get pretty, they still get pretty big. Yeah. It's kind of like an ulu with Seeds. It's like an ulu that's, that's almost mostly seeds. You oh, eat the seeds? You eat the seeds, yep, you cook the seeds. It's the original Yeah. And then so and then we have um, then we have jackfruit, which um, makes a lot of a sweet fruit, but also the seeds of jackfruit you can eat. Um, you can cook those down, they've got a little husk on them, you take that off, you can uh, blend them up, make them into like a hummus type thing. Uh, quite good. Produces massive amounts of fruit. You'll see one out in the orchard here when we do our walk in a minute. How is um, the jackfruit up on the higher elevation? Jackfruit can do higher elevation as well. Yeah. And jackfruit also, you can cook the fruit when it's when it's still young. You can make um, you can make like uh, it's people use it as like a meat substitute sometimes because the texture is like um, it's kind of like stringy like that. So you're talking so about the flesh as opposed to the seeds. The, the flesh, everything, the seeds, everything. Well, it's still young before it's formed seed coats. You can just chop it all up. There's recipes online for like uh, jack, young jackfruit pulled pork. <laughs> <laughs> it looks exactly like it, too. It's crazy. You Wait. gotta make sure you oil your knife. Oil your Wait. knife, yes, thoroughly, Wait. and your pan, too. Wait, yeah. I I'm sorry. So when you're talking about uh, the jackfruit, how, how big is it when it's completely young for that meat replacement um, thing? Fairly small. Okay. And there's fairly no small. seed development in it? Um, there seeds? is still seed development, but it hasn't formed, because they form this little like uh, like tough layer around the seeds. Yep. So you just want to get it before, and you just may need to do a little experimentation. I haven't used it too much. Yeah. How do you know when jackfruit's right? Uh, smell, yeah. color. Fruit flies flying around it. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, macadamia nut. Um, another great one. Again, you do have to beat the pigs to them, though, if you're letting them fall on the ground. But we got uhi, the Chinese yam, which I didn't bring a root of, um, but I did bring a seed of it. 
can't find it. I'll show you later. Um, but it's an aggressive vine um, that'll die back when it's formed its roots. And they can form huge roots. It's a really underused crop. Um, the uhi or Chinese yam. And there's several different varieties. There's one variety that forms a long tuber like this. There's some varieties that form, they look almost exactly like potatoes. And then there's some that form like this kind of like multi-lobed, weird alien looking root. Um, but I, I highly recommend um, getting the different varieties. Mountain yam is what one of the small one goes by. Um, the name, common name. Um, then we have air potato, which is in that same family produces aerial tubers. Okay, so it produces these on the vine. Same family, um, not nearly as aggressive as a vine, um, can take a little bit of shade. Um, and there is a wild version of this that has that uh, circular fruit that is not edible and it's highly invasive. So this one has earned a bad reputation because of that wild uh, cousin, the non-cultivated type.